Hello everyone and welcome back to this Nanophotonics and Plasmonics course. Uh, today's chapter 5 uh, which will cover quantum emitters. So uh, let's dive uh, into this, uh, this topic. Uh, so the first thing to notice is that due to the special confinement, uh, various more systems such as molecules and quantum dots exhibit a very discrete resonant behavior uh, where the resonances occur uh, only when there's an incident photon which matches the energy difference between consecutive electronic states. Thus, emitters uh, can be described using two-level systems, uh, typically, uh, and uh, in this particular chapter, uh, we will focus on the emitters themselves, uh, noting that uh, the previous chapter on optical interactions focused on the properties of the emitter and how they interacted with light. So we have uh, three families of quantum emitters, fluorescent molecules, semiconducting quantum dots, uh, but also defect centers in diamond. Uh, so we're going to cover the, those three families of quantum emitters in this course. Let's first start looking at uh, fluorescent molecule uh, and looking at the excitation uh, process. So this is the electronic states uh, electron configuration of a fluorescent molecule. Uh, so the electronic state, uh, which is at the lowest energy, uh, this is the ground state, uh, is called the HOMO. So this is the highest occupied molecular orbital. So this is the ground electronic state, uh, which is also subdivided into a vibrational sublevels uh, of the molecules. Now we have also uh, excited states that the electron can, can occupy. And within these excited states, we have also uh, vibrational sublevels. Uh, this first excited state, first electronic excited state, is the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So when the molecule is in its ground state, uh, in absence of any excitation, all the electrons uh, are filling uh, the states all the way to, to this uh, to this HOMO. Uh, so we're going to discard the, the, uh, the highest uh, excited states here as the transition from the HOMO to, to those excited states is uh, has a very low probability. So we're going to just limit ourselves to this uh, two-level system uh, between the HOMO and the, and the LUMO, between the ground state and uh, the first excited state. Uh, so what we're going to focus on is the, the light absorption process uh, uh, that's going to uh, promote electrons from the, the HOMO to the, to the LUMO and on the emission process uh, when uh, the electrons will undergo a transition from the LUMO uh, back to the, to the HOMO. Uh, so everything that happens in between, uh, we'll discuss that in a second, uh, are basically non-radiative uh, decay channels, uh, such as the emission of uh, vibrations uh, and collisions with, uh, with the environment. Uh, so the fluorescence emission process uh, occurs on the nanosecond scale, uh, but uh, yeah, there's also another uh, emission process, uh, which is the phosphorescence that occurs at the millisecond uh, time scale, uh, and this occurs only when uh, the molecule is excited and then it, some electrons undergo an electronic transition from this first singlet state, uh, first singlet excited state, all the way to, uh, to a first uh, excited triplet state. Uh, so this inter-system crossing occurs uh, as a result of the spin orbit coupling, and it goes beyond uh, our scope of, of this work. And because of the time scale uh, of this phosphorescence, we actually can discard this, uh, this part. Uh, something which is important to notice is that as a result of transitions that can occur between the LUMO uh, and the different uh, vibrational sublevels, the emission uh, spectrum will be actually shifted as compared to the absorption spectrum. And this uh, is what we call the sh stock shift that we're going to discuss in a, in a minute. So uh, let's focus more on, the, on these uh, processes, the absorption and the emission processes. So every uh, excited state uh, will quickly, quickly decay non-radiative uh, to the LUMO vibrational ground state. So if you start with uh, electrons in a ground electronic state and ground vibrational state, uh, which is uh, right here, then uh, if you send high energy excitation, and you can promote the electrons to very high uh, excited states, high electronic states like this S2 that we just discarded or uh, toward this S1, the first excited electronic state 
uh, that we uh, will focus on. Now, within this first uh, excited state, uh, the electron can be promoted to any of these vibrational uh, sublevel. It will quickly decay and relax back to this vibrational ground state within the first uh, electronic excited state. So these uh, dashed arrows here represent those, those transitions uh, and these are non-radiative transitions. So there, there's no emission of light uh, and the energy which is lost is basically um, converted into vibrations. Uh, once the, uh, the electrons are on this ground vibrational state or the first excited state or the LUMO, uh, then those electrons will actually uh, relax back down to the ground electronic state or the OMO in their, uh, in their vibrational ground state. So these transitions uh, are basically generating the fluorescence signal. Uh, so something which is important to notice are the time scales. So the, the absorption part uh, occurs very rapidly. So uh, photons are absorbed on the femtosecond time scale. Uh, then the non-radiative uh, relaxations through vibrational uh, uh, and internal conversions uh, occurs on the picosecond time scale. Uh, the fluorescence itself, as I just mentioned, is a nanosecond time scale. And the phosphorescence uh, process on the uh, millisecond time scale. So uh, these transition strength uh, from between the OMO and the LUMO is given by uh, a dipole uh, operator uh, within the dipole approximation. So if you remember what we discussed in chapter four, we are dealing with very small objects. So the dipole approximation holds uh, very well for those particular systems. If you excite resonantly uh, those, those molecules, you can actually preserve uh, the coherence uh, between the excitation field and the emitted field. Uh, and this can be uh, done only if the molecule is actually isolated from the environment. Uh, otherwise, if the molecule is not isolated from the environment, then you can have some uh, environmental dephasing uh, occurring as a result of collisions and phonon scattering. So these are just a few examples of emission spectra of different molecules. So you, as you change the length of the molecule, uh, you can actually shift um, the emission spectrum of the molecule throughout uh, a significant uh, spectral range. Uh, the same here to really shift uh, the, the, the optical emission of the, the molecule, uh, the fluorescence from 2 nanometers wavelength all the way to 600 nanometers, so from the, the UV all the way to uh, to the deep uh, visible. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, there are those non-radiative decays that occur, uh, and this uh, they, they happen all the time, uh, and this is responsible for uh, the presence of the uh, stock shift of the fluorescence, uh, which is just the, the uh, spectral shift that occur between the emission peak uh, the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum. So that uh, for a given molecule, the molecule will absorb light uh, very efficiently at, at, at a given energy or given wavelength and will emit light at a different energy or wavelength. So um, let's uh, look at this relaxation uh, process a little bit further. Uh, so we can emit light and this is the radiative relaxation from the, from the LUMO to the, to the OMO, uh, which is just the fluorescence. Uh, this is described by uh, the radiative uh, decay rate. And then there's this non-radiative relaxation process that occur uh, via the emission of uh, vibrations or via collisions, uh, which often result in, uh, in heat. And this is described by this uh, non-radiative uh, decay rate. Uh, so we can introduce a very important uh, property, uh, which is the internal quantum yield Q. Uh, which is the ratio between the radiative decay rate versus the total uh, decay rate, both radiative and non-radiative. So this is looking at uh, how much of the, the optical excitation, which is absorbed by the molecule, uh, will actually be converted into radiations, into fluorescence. So the emission spectrum, uh, but also the, uh, the absorption spectrum, uh, it's just the sum of uh, resonances, individual resonances from each vibrational sublevel 
uh, convoluted by natural broadening due to the temperature. And this is just uh, absorption and uh, emission from a single homo state uh, all the way to a single uh, lumo state. But within uh, each of them, uh, there are those uh, vibrational energy levels uh, that will contribute uh, to the transitions. And you can look at uh, the overall absorption spectrum or uh, emission spectrum as just a collection of those individual transitions. Uh, that are occurring between the vibrational uh, sublevels from the UMO and the OMO. So the fluorescence efficiency in the end uh, will depend on the density of uh, vibrational states. Uh, so uh, you can uh, fairly uh, obviously see that if you increase the density of vibrational state in the, in the LUMO, for instance, uh, then you're going to have uh, much more non-radiative decay rate uh, and then therefore you're going to decrease the quantum, uh, the quantum yield and uh, as a result you're going to have much less uh, fluorescence. So um, this is something which is, uh, which is very important is that yeah, the more degrees of freedom you have the less fluorescence. Uh, the second family of, quant of uh, quantum emitter uh, or the quantum dots uh, made of semiconductors uh, they have been used for a long time, since the early 80s, uh, and this is because uh, they have uh, controllable and tunable optical properties. Uh, and this is a, a direct uh, result of the quantum confinement uh, that occur in those, in those systems. Uh, so uh, if you look at excitons, which are just uh, electron hole pairs that are being formed when uh, sending light on those systems, uh, so the electron being promoted from the the valence, uh, the valence band on, uh, into the conduction band and we leave a hole in the valence band uh, they're going to remain coupled via Coulomb attraction uh, this object uh, which is a quasi particle can be described quantum mechanically introducing an Hamiltonian to describe its energy uh, which contains the, uh, the uh, kinetic energy of the, uh, the hole the kinetic energy of the electron and the potential energy uh, uh, resulting from the Coulomb attraction between the electron and the hole as a function, of course, of the, the distance uh, between the electron and the hole. So this average distance between the electron and hole is known as the, the Bohr radius of the, uh, the exciton. So uh, when uh, you're looking at small uh, quantum dots uh, that are typically the size of the, uh, the Bohr radius of this exciton, uh, which is typically in the, in the range of 10 nanometers or, or below, uh, then we have a, a quantum confinement, uh, which is gonna force the exciton uh, to squeeze. Uh, so the exciton will start filling the, uh, the outer surface of the quantum dot. And as a result, uh, you can actually change the energy of the exciton. Uh, so if you start with a typical uh, picture of the band structure uh, of a, a semiconductor, you have the, the valence uh, band at the bottom, you have the conduction band at the top, uh, the separation energy between the two of them is you know, the, the gap energy. As you, uh, you, you decrease the size of the quantum dot, you're gonna increase the gap uh, between the, the energy of the hole and the energy of the, uh, and the electron. So as a, as a direct consequence, uh, as you increase this, uh, this transition uh, energy, you can therefore uh, allow the, the quantum dot to emit at different uh, different energies. It's going to result in different colors uh, for the light emission of those, those quantum dots as you just change the size uh, of the quantum dot. Uh, something which is uh, very important to, to discuss uh, is the absorption and emission uh, spectra of those quantum dots. Uh, so uh, if you look at the absorption spectra of the quantum dots, uh, they exhibit a very strong absorption strength at high energy uh, or at low wavelength. Uh, and this is just uh, the result of a high electronic state density uh, in the conduction band. So as you go further in the conduction band, then you, you have a, uh, an increase of number of uh, electronic states that are available for the electron. Uh, and that's going to result in this uh, strong absorption strength at high energy. Uh, so this is something very important and very useful because this allows actually to excite uh, quantum dots of different sizes uh, using a single 
a single wavelength. So even though you have quantum dots with different sizes, you can excite all of them with a UV excitation. So they're, they're going to absorb all of them, going to absorb this UV excitation. Uh, now, the excess of energy of uh, in, within each of these quantum dots will actually uh, relax uh, and be released via fast uh, non-radiative internal conversion, such as vibration and collisions, uh, very similarly to, to molecules. And uh, once the, the relaxed electron uh, reaches the lowest excited state, it will actually undergo then uh, recombination with the hole, uh, and then that's going to be uh, giving rise to emission of light at a very specific wavelength. So this is the, the, the emission spectra, uh, so the emission spectra of those uh, different quantum dots with uh, sizes ranging from uh, 3 nanometers in diameter all the way to 6 nanometers in diameter. Uh, so you have one single excitation for all the quantum dot sizes uh, and then you have specific emissions uh, at different colors, different wavelengths based on the size of the quantum dot. Uh, something which is also worth mentioning is that the quantum dots uh, they show a very high potential for quantum information as they can serve as, as, as qubit. Um, so you can control those excitonic states uh, coherently using a short pulse lasers. Uh, you can actually generate uh, by excitons uh, in uh, single quantum dots. And then you can basically use the state of those excitons uh, to actually encode uh, your, your qubit. So this is something which is shown here. Where you have no exciton, one exciton on the second bit, second bit here, uh, one exciton on the first one, or basically two excitons at the same time. So uh, now let's move on to the last class of quantum emitter, uh, those fluorescent defect senders, uh, typically in uh, wide band semiconductors. Uh, we're gonna just try to focus here on, on diamonds. Uh, so typically, what, what happens is that if you have, for instance, a, a diamond. Uh, structure made of just uh, carbon atoms. Uh, if you substitute uh, one of the carbon atoms by an additional uh, element like boron, for instance, it's going to leave a vacancy behind, and this boron vacancy uh, defect will actually trap electrons, uh, and which basically will be able to uh, to serve as uh, fluorescent centers. So uh, people have looked at diamond, as I said because there are large band gaps uh, of 5.5 electron volts. People have also looked at uh, silicon carbide uh, as they also exhibit uh, very large band gaps ranging from two electron volt to seven electron volts. Uh, so you can substitute uh, those carbons uh, by uh, elements such as nitrogen, boron, uh, nickel or cobalt. And in fact, those defects exist uh, naturally uh, there are over hundreds of them, uh, and in fact, they are responsible for the actual color of diamonds that you can find in nature. Uh, so if you focus on the nitrogen vacancy, uh, the NV centers, uh, because they, they contain two unbound electrons coming from the nitrogen uh, atom, uh, then you can form two types of centers. You can form the NV negative center and the NV uh, neutral centers. Uh, so we're not going to discuss extensively what, what they are. I just want to mention that uh, those two centers fluorescence uh, at different wavelengths. So the NV neutral uh, center will fluorescence at about 600 nanometers wavelength, while the NV negative will fluorescence at higher wavelength at about 700 nanometers. Um, so this is something which is fixed and cannot be tuned. Uh, however, we have those two states and they fluorescence at a very specific uh, specific wavelength. So we have very, uh, very nice colors. Uh, and actually they can also uh, be controlled in terms of intensity. So uh, I will pass on quickly, but um, if you apply a microwave uh, signal onto the, those, those centers, uh, this will induce a spin transition uh, that will allow the electrons to actually take a different path for the, for the decay uh, down to the ground state. Uh, so you're gonna actually favor non-radiative decay or you're gonna favor uh, radiative decay depending on the on the spin state you're, uh, you're transitioning from. Uh, and this can lead to uh, actually a 30% modulation of the, uh, the luminescence intensity. Since we are dealing with light absorption in those uh, quantum emitters, uh, we have to, to, uh, to, quant to quantize this light absorption. And it, this can be described using a frequency-dependent optical cross-section that we'll define in a, in a minute. 
Um, so for weak excitations, when the, the, the optical excitation intensity is, uh, is fairly weak, uh, the absorbed power can be actually calculated and expressed as, as, as follow, uh, where we have the imaginary part of the polarizability of the, uh, either the molecule or the quantum dot. And we have the electric field uh, from the excitation and the NP here is the unit vector uh, aligned with uh, the dipole moment, uh, which is describing the, the molecule or the quantum dot. Uh, the absorption cross-section can be calculated from there. Uh, so this is given for one given orientation for the dipole for one single molecule. Uh, now, if you have an ensemble of molecules that have uh, different orientations, the dipole moment will have different orientations. Uh, so you can average this over all the dipole orientations that you have and in order to calculate uh, the absorption cross-section, which is just the, the average uh, absorbed power over the intensity of the, uh, the, uh, the incident plane wave. Uh, it can also be calculated using the extension coefficient uh, from the molecule, uh, but this is just more as a, as a side note. So what's the physical meaning of this cross-section? Uh, so this is the definition that I really like, coming directly from the, the uh, principle of nano-optics uh, textbook. So the field of an incoming plane wave is actually modified by the field scattered off the molecule or the quantum dot uh, being represented by the point dipole. Uh, the emitted dipole field uh, and the, excit uh, the excitation plane wave uh, interfere uh, between each other and give rise to the resulting energy flow which within an area defined by this uh, absorption cross segment, section sigma is directed toward the dipole. So everything which is within this uh, region of space defined by sigma has an energy flow that uh, points toward the dipole, toward the molecule. So this is uh, something we're going to also discuss extensively when we're going to be talking about uh, plasmons. So Single molecules uh, can be used uh, for near-field microscopy. They can serve as a local probe of the, the local electric field. Uh, and this is because they describe as point dipoles. So if you have, if you have a molecule which is on the substrate, uh, if you approach a probe uh, that has a certain, a certain electric field uh, coming from an optical excitation, uh, this molecule, uh, which is described as this point dipole, will actually interact with the field uh, and uh, modify its fluorescence. So if you actually uh, know the uh, fluorescence emission rate of the molecule, uh, you can actually uh, go back and uh, you have a direct measurement of the projected field strength uh, from the field uh, which is interacting with this, with this molecule. So this is something which is very important. Uh, and this can be, can be used in many applications. Uh, these are just a few examples uh, about uh, fluorescence uh, imaging. Uh, so you have uh, calculated fluorescence rate patterns here for different more simple molecules uh, with different orientations. So we have here a molecule which is actually pointing uh, in, the, in the out of plane direction. Uh, here we have a molecule which is actually in plane. Uh, and those two molecules are actually uh, with orientation that are taken in between. Uh, these are measured uh, fluorescence uh, patterns uh, from different randomly oriented molecules and based on uh, based on the, the pattern you have here uh, you can go back and, and relate to the actual orientation of the of the of the molecules so you can uh, identify the orientation of the molecule based on its fluorescence pattern uh, and how it interacts with the, um, the optical field uh, these are just uh, final examples I wanted to show uh, where you, uh, you, you, you can actually have an, uh, ensembles of molecules that are dispersed on the substrate. Uh, you can write with a sharp metallic tip, uh, which plays the role of, uh, of, uh, of a dipole, an electric dipole that would interact also with the uh, dipoles of the molecules. So we, we, we talked about dipole-dipole interaction in Chapter 4. Uh, that, would be a, that would be one of the, the situations. Uh, you can actually measure and calculate uh, the radiation pattern uh, from this fluorescence measurement. Uh, you can go back to the polarization. Uh, the, the light is being polarized, uh, which molecule is actually uh, being lit up. So it can uh, 
uh, give you a relative orientation of the molecules with respect to the to the tip dipole, and that's going to be uh, dictated by the how bright or the or the lobes uh, on the on the map. So this actually gives uh, rise to, the, to a specific field, which is the molecular nanophotonics. So uh, just to, to conclude uh, and summarize this chapter, so we would choose uh, three types of uh, quantum emitters, fluorescent molecules, quantum dots, and uh, color senders in diamonds, uh, discussing their absorption and emission spectra uh, via the fluorescence process, introducing the concept of radiative and non-radiative decay rates uh, and uh, internal quantum yield, uh, we've defined the concept of absorption cross-section in a weak excitation regime uh, and we, did, we showed a few examples of uh, fluorescent molecules uh, used as uh, near-field probes.